much earlier than we do because they cannot afford proper medical care. Even if you just count only those causes of death that are essentially confined among the poor, and I'm listing them here, even then you get to 18 million or one third of all human deaths. If you put that in perspective and compare it to the big catastrophes of the 20th century, you see that even compared to something like the Second World War, which killed up to 60 million people, this catastrophe of poverty is substantially larger. In fact, more people have died, about twice as many people have died in the last 21 years since the end of the Cold War from poverty-related causes than have died from government-inflicted violence in the entire 20th century. Gulags, concentration camps, wars, civil wars, the whole enchilada. Now, let's relate that to justice and let's relate it to rights. Just is an evaluative predicate. So justice is not a thing, but rather a predicate of things, a property of things. And it's important to see that it's not a property that's purely empirical. Normally, when you have a predicate that you ascribe to something, if you know the definition of the word, and if you know all the empirical facts, then you know whether the predicate applies or not. But justice is a little bit different because there's also a theoretical component. So two theorists of justice can agree on all the facts and they can also agree on the definition of the word justice and they can still disagree about whether the predicate applies to a particular object or not. That disagreement is possible because people have different conceptions of justice, different ideas about what justice might require, even while they agree on what the word justice means. So here we have three types of disagreement, linguistic, empirical, and theoretical. Now the word justice can apply to four different kinds of yudikanda, four different kinds of things that can be said to be just or unjust. We apply it to agents, individual and collective. We apply it to the conduct of agents. We apply it to social rules, social institutions, and finally also to states of the world. Prominent in political philosophy of the last two, three decades has been the application to social institutions, what's also called social justice. So we have learned and understood that the social rules that structure our interactions have an immense impact on outcomes in the world, on how many people go hungry, how many people are murdered, and so on. Social rules in the modern world are the most important determinant of humanly significant outcomes. And Rawls, of course, my dissertation advisor, played a very major role in this shift in focusing attention on the justice of social rules. Now, for the nation state, we have pretty much a national consensus that we can draw on in thinking about what an appropriate conception of justice would be. Rawls tried to do that for the United States of America and Indian theorists are doing that for India. But for the world at large, many people think that the diversity of cultures and traditions is so great that it's very difficult to come to any conclusions about what just international institutions should be. So I told you at the beginning that these new global or supranational institutional arrangements are of incredible importance in shaping results on the ground in the modern world. And so we would like to bring them within reach of moral theorizing. But many people are skeptical because they say that this diversity of cultures and traditions makes it hard to agree on any common standpoint from which these rules could be evaluated. Now I think we can make progress by appealing to what is perhaps the most widely agreed moral notion in modern discourse, which is the notion of human rights. Human rights are usually thought of as applying to agents, that agents such as governments or armies should, in their conduct, observe human rights. They should not violate human rights. But I think human rights can also be applied to institutional arrangements, to the kinds of rules that states institute at the national level and that many states together institute at the international level. The idea is quite simple. Rules 
have alternatives. We can design the rules in this way or in that way, and depending on how we design them, human rights will be better fulfilled or worse fulfilled within the system that is governed by these rules. And so you might say, while we cannot agree on a full conception of justice at this point for the global level, we can agree at least on this much, that a very important, if not the most important, demand that we should make morally on the rules at the international level is the demand that they should be designed to fulfill and realize human rights insofar as that is reasonably possible. This is a very weak theory of global justice. I'm sure that all of you will have additional demands, for example, about uh, avoiding excessive inequalities and so on. But even if you just impose that very minimal demand, you must confront the frightening thought that the rules that we have at the global level are quite substantially unjust because they generate a great excess of human rights under fulfillment. Better rules at the international level could do vastly better in fulfilling human rights. And of course, the deficits that we have are, as I showed you earlier, the human rights deficits are enormous. Now, just when you thought I'd said something new and original, I have to disappoint you. This is already in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where we find a much neglected article, 28, which says that everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. That's exactly what I'm saying, that human rights are not just demands on agents such as governments and armies, but they are also demands on rules, what, how the rules should be shaped, what these rules should be like. And so I see international law as divided against itself. Since World War II, governments have created a Sunday portion, sorry, this is Christian terminology, but a kind of holiday portion of international law where they put in all sorts of high-sounding human rights. Everybody's entitled to this and that and the other thing. And that's a good thing, of course. That is something to be celebrated. But governments have also put in, especially since the end of the Cold War, a lot of other rules that frustrate, systematically undermine the fulfillment of these human rights, in particular as regards social and economic human rights. If we had different, better rules at the global level, we would have much smaller human rights deficits in the world today. Now, this may sound like a somewhat pessimistic conclusion, so let me, at the end, say something optimistic about what we can and should do. If I think myself into your position as Indian citizens concerned about justice, I think that most of your attention will be focused on Indian politics. You will say, we know where the shoe pinches. We know why so many people in India are still poor. It's failures of our political system, failures of our politicians, corruption everywhere in the system. That's the problem. And right you are, of course. That is a very big problem. But I think there is another problem as well, which is the problem of international institutions. And I think that India is particularly well positioned to play a very important role in making sure that the interests of the poor are properly considered in the negotiations that shape our ever more influential international order. So I would ask you to think about that aspect as well and see whether you can influence your government towards taking that more seriously, taking a leadership role together with other emerging economies such as Brazil and uh, South Africa, for example, in weighing in more heavily in the interests of poor people everywhere when it comes to designing international arrangements. What we need here, I think, is to contest the influence of the large corporations, the banks, the industry associations, and make sure that at least the impact on poor people of various ways of shaping these rules is also considered. Here's one set of desiderata that we should bear in mind here. 
In contesting this rule-making, rule-shaping process, we should look for structural changes. We should not look for initiatives, band-aids, that will work here and now for a particular problem, but try to shift the rules in favor of the poor in a way that is lasting and enduring. We should find reforms that very palpably manifest the thought that all human lives matter and matter equally, even the lives of the poor. We should find reforms that do not pit the interests of the poor against the entire rest of humankind, but rather reforms that are in the interest also of at least a segment of the more privileged elites. We should try to find reforms that we can start relatively small so they're easy to achieve. We can then clean them up and uh, iron out any unforeseen bad effects of them and then scale them up when they operate smoothly. We should try reforms, try to find reforms that empower the poor, allow them to find their own voice and become partners in their own emancipation. And we should find reforms that can be a model that bring further reforms in other areas within reach. So thinking about these desiderata, I've come up with a whole group of people from different countries, including India, and different disciplines with the project of the Health Impact Fund. The Health Impact Fund is a way, addresses a way or a problem in the way in which pharmaceutical innovation is now being incentivized and rewarded. Now, if you thought about this from scratch, how should we do that? How should we reward and incentivize pharmaceutical innovation? I think you would come up with the following three very obvious principles. Ideally, such a system should make sure that patients have access to important existing medicines, regardless of the country where they live and regardless of their income. Medicines, after all, are extremely cheap to produce, very little chemicals that you can mass produce at very low cost. If they're important, every human being should have access to them. Second, research and development efforts should target the innovations that promise the largest health gains. And third, the entire system should be cost effective so that any money spent on medicines by patients or insurance companies and so on will achieve as much as possible for human health. As much as that money of that money should go back into research and development of new medicines, as little of that money should be going to lawyers and overhead expenses and so on. Now, if you look at the existing system, you find that the existing system does very poorly on all three grounds. This is a slide about access. How do we reward new medicines now? We reward them by allowing a temporary monopoly, a patent-protected temporary monopoly, and that was particularly painful in India. India came under the TRIPS agreement on the 1st of January 2005 and had to switch from a process patent system to a product patent system, which protected a molecule absolutely regardless of how it is produced. What that meant basically is that pharmaceutical innovators can take out patents and can, without any fear of competition, monopolize a particular molecule until the patent expires. And so poor people all over India lose access to new advanced medicines, or insofar as they can have access, they get access at the expense of ruining their families financially. You can see here a primitive demand curve indicating this large inequality that I showed you at the beginning. If you're a monopolist and try to maximize the profit that you gain from your monopoly, and if you have free pricing power, you will obviously price the product in such a way that your markup multiplied by the sales volume is as large as possible. And when the demand curve is shaped like this, when there is enormous inequality in the world and also in the country, you will choose a very high price simply because lowering your price so as to include 30, 40, 50 percent of the population will, yes, gain you customers, but it will lose you more on the markup than you gain on additional customers. So the optimal monopoly price is very high. 
That's why pharmaceutical companies charge such high prices. And so the poor are punished twice over. They're punished by being poor, and they're also punished by being very much poorer than others, which makes it rational to raise prices very high. Secondly, the problem of where is innovation focused? Well, it's not focused on the diseases of the poor. There's the famous 1090 gap, which means that 10% of all pharmaceutical research is focused on diseases that represent 90% of the global burden of disease. And of course, vice versa, 90% of all pharmaceutical R&D is focused on only 10% of the global burden of disease. So there's a tremendous mismatch between what pharmaceutical companies research and what the world really needs, what real human beings need. The neglected diseases are named that way for a reason. They are the diseases of the poor, which is simply not worth pharmaceutical companies' effort to research. And thirdly, we also have problems with overall efficiency. The vast majority of the money that the world spends for new medicines, about a trillion dollars every year, does not go back into pharmaceutical research, but it goes into patenting, into trying to litigate, trying to extend your patents as much as possible, evergreening, lobbying efforts, uh, into wasteful marketing where companies are trying to take away market share from one another, and into counterfeiting where clever people try to make pills that look like the real thing but really aren't, and then selling them to unwitting poor patients who are desperately trying to get treatment for themselves or their loved ones. So the efficiency of the system is also very poor. So here is a wonderful opportunity for reform, a reform that can